Hello there. This recording by the police of non-crime hate incidents must surely stop, especially where there is a chance that it could potentially lose someone a job opportunity or even cost them the job they actually hold. But first, as ever, please kick that YouTube algorithm up the rear by giving this video a big fat like and I'm always uploading new content, so please do check back daily. Now, a former police officer, Harry Miller, won a court case last week regarding overzealous policing against him, where they admitted during the so-called investigation that he'd committed no crime at all, but they were going to investigate it anyway. And this was, of course, all about an allegation of online Twitter hate crime, where people can have non-crime hate incidents lodged against them and kept on record by the police. Harry Miller, aka Harry the Owl, retweeted a verse of someone else's concoction, which was interpreted by one person who read his tweet as a phobic tweet, due to the nature of the social media conversation taking place. That person reported it to the police, who then decided to dispatch an officer to go and check the thinking of Harry Miller over the 30 or so tweets and retweets that he was responsible for. Now, I watched the YouTube channel Trigonometry interview with Harry Miller, and his description of the whole process is jaw-dropping. The police turned up at Immingham Dock where the company he owns is situated and asked to have a word with Mr Miller. Miller was in Tesco shopping at the time and his managing director called him and said that the police had been in asking to talk to him. So Harry the Owl Miller phoned the police officer involved back to find out what was occurring. And this was where it got really surreal. Miller was told that he'd been posting stuff on Twitter that could make his workplace dangerous for trans people. But when Miller asked what crime he'd committed, he was told no crime had been committed. But, said the officer, I'm talking to you to check your thinking. To which Harry the Owl said, So hold on, you're a policeman, and you're checking my thinking. Have you any idea what that makes you? To which the officer, it seems, was sublimely unaware of George Orwell, his book 1984, and the concept of thought police. And even though absolutely no crime had been committed, the police officer kept on referring to the victim. Anyway, after the police got a bit heavy-handed with him, Mr Miller won a court case against Humberside Police over this, and the judge... Mr Justice Julian Knowles was scathing in his comments, saying, The claimant's tweets were lawful, and there was not the slightest risk that he would commit a criminal offence by continuing to tweet. I find the combination of the police visiting the claimant's place of work and their subsequent statements in relation to the possibility of prosecution were a disproportionate interference with the claimant's right to freedom of expression because of their potential chilling effect. He also said that the potential effect on free speech from the police turning up at Miller's place of work because of his political opinions must not be underestimated. To do so would be to undervalue a cardinal democratic freedom. In this country we have never had a Cheka, a Gestapo or a Stasi. We have never lived in an Orwellian society. And the judge concluded by saying that the police left the claimant with the clear belief that he was being warned to not exercise his right to freedom of expression on pain of potential criminal prosecution. But importantly, the judge did rule that the College of Policing Guidelines on Collecting Details of Non-Crime Hate Incidents was lawful, given the aim of preventing any escalation of hate crime and taking steps to prevent hate crime and hate incidents. He did, however, give Harry Miller a route to appeal that ruling, which I do hope his group faircop.org.uk are able to follow through on. 
Faircop is campaigning for the College of Policing to change its hate crime guidance. Now remember that a hate crime is an actual crime involving one of the defined hates. But a hate incident involves no crime. So why is it being recorded at all? That recording requirement is driven by the 2014 College of Policing Operational Guidance on Hate Crime, which says that all actions with an element of hate in them must be recorded irrespective of whether there is any evidence to identify the hate element. As a result, we now have nearly 120,000 such incidents on the books. This guidance also says a non-crime hate incident is defined as any non-crime incident which is perceived by the victim or any other person to be motivated wholly or partly by a hostility or prejudice. So as far as I can see, the police will still record the details of people who have been accused of showing nothing more than maybe a lack of taste or bad manners. But what the police can't do anymore is go around treating those people in exactly the same manner as those accused of a real criminal offence. But that recording requirement also has repercussions. Because it turns out that these events can show up on DBS checks when people apply for jobs. Big question here. Does every single person who has had a non-crime hate incident logged against them know about it? The bottom line here is that we had got to the stage where through a few hurty words someone could lose their job, be turned down for a job, as well as lose family and friends, even though they had committed absolutely no criminal offence at all. Or to put it another way, we were entering the lefty lovey's perfect world. Hopefully, this judgment by Mr Justice Knowles will be one of the building blocks helping to take the UK back to the rock-steady ground of common sense and much wider freedom of expression. And if we are to have this non-crime hate incident reporting, then, just as in any other sphere of public service, those affected must have the absolute right to know what data the police hold on them regarding such non-crime incidents, and more importantly, have access to a free and robust mechanism to challenge them and have them removed from the records. Why not? Anyone who has committed no crime but appears on such a database should have the right to know which other government and non-government agencies also have access to that information. There should also be a set time limit for any such information to be held by police forces and any other body, preferably zero days. And further, there should also be a way that those who end up on this list and who are subject to multiple complaints can determine if this was done by malicious players and be able to take appropriate action. And all this is crucially important. Just as a quick example, can you imagine if you're seeking to become a foster parent, but unknown to you, someone complained about a Facebook post you made five years ago? The public must be protected against this holding of non-crime incident data. It is being collected, stored and dealt with in a manner that potentially disadvantages people who have committed no criminal offence at all. People who, as far as I can see, have absolutely no way of knowing or taking action over it. And that cannot be fair or just. Having read that 2014 guidance, there seems to be no protection at all for those accused of a non-crime hate incident unless they have deep pockets and are prepared to go through the courts, and that should worry us all. Given recent developments, it looks like our boys and girls in blue were well on the way to becoming full-on thought police. And we must put every legal and administrative obstacle in the way of that ever becoming a terrifying reality. Anyway, if you want to hear more from me, please don't forget to subscribe and also press that little bell or you won't get any notifications. 
And if you want to see more of me, buy a mug with my mug on it. So what do you think? Should the police have carte blanche to keep records on non-crime incidents? Please share and comment and thank you for listening.